Hi everyone, welcome to the 10th lecture of MD6028 for the year. Um, today we're introducing the topic of epidemiology within virology and we're going to be going into it in some amount of detail. I know we've touched on epidemiology in the past and perhaps on other modules too, so you'll have an idea of what epidemiology is, but what we really want to do is go into um, a bit more detail and actually look at some of the aspects of uh, epidemiology that are of most concern to virologists. So we're going to look at epidemiology from a virology perspective. So we've arrived at this point by um, working through the first portion of the module, which is discussing viruses themselves. So discussing the core concepts within virology, discussing the different types of viruses, how we define viruses, um, all the different groups of viruses, things like that. Then we um, moved into discussing viruses as pathogens. So discussing the ability of viruses to cause disease. Um, we spent a little bit of time working through that, looking at the different types of disease that viruses cause, trying to understand why different viruses cause different disease. Um, and now we're emerging from that portion of the module and entering into the epidemiology portion. Um, and that's what we're going to tackle now. So again, we're going to be thinking about epidemiology. The first portion of the module is going to be spent defining epidemiology. And again, you might have had this information in some context before. You might understand um, what epidemiology is, for example, but I'd encourage you to still engage with the first portion of the, mo of the lecture because it's really important these concepts are fresh in your mind. It's really important that you have a very clear, lucid idea of what epidemiology is, why epidemiology is important. It just lays out the context for the lecture. Fundamentally, when we're using the term epidemiology, we're referring to um, the study of infectious disease at a population level, right? So when we think about infectious disease, we can actually think about it from two principal perspectives. We can think about it from an individual level, um, and a lot of that is centered on pathogenesis, which we've talked about. So in a way, that's what we looked at in the last section of the module. We looked at how viral infection impacts an individual. And understanding this is tied up in diagnosis and different um, uh, kind of treatments and things like that. This is all thinking about disease at an individual level. Um, when we're discussing epidemiology, we're taking a step back and we're thinking about disease at a population level. Now, when we're thinking about disease at a population level, we can gain insights and we can gain information that we would not be able to gain at an individual level. So when we're thinking about it at a population level, we're gaining new insights, we're gaining um, new perspectives, we're gaining new um, information. For example, we can gain information about the susceptibility of different demographics. We can gain information about how quickly it's spreading, um, what pattern it's spreading throughout a population. Is it moving outside the population? Where did it begin in the population? What's the incidence? What's the prevalence? And again, these are sp specific terms to virology. These are just epidemiological terms that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, the, the, the key principle, the key takeaway here is the idea that epidemiology is a study at a population level and it enables us to gain insight into infectious disease that we wouldn't otherwise gain if we were just thinking about individuals, if we were just thinking about pathogenesis and diagnosis and treatment and these individual events. Um, it's, it's kind of intuitive in a way. So if you're just looking at individual cases, if you're just looking at how the virus interacts with an individual person, you're not going to get population data. You're not going to have statistics. You're not really going to know if older people are more susceptible or younger people are more susceptible on all these different areas of epidemiology. So what we really want to do is um, when we're dealing with infectious disease is devote a significant amount of our time to thinking about these diseases from a population perspective. So from an epidemiological perspective. Now, there is an ultimate goal here. It's not just I realise I'm being a little bit vague, saying, well, we get this information and this information. But fundamentally, um, the reason why we want this information is because it is going to inform our efforts to do something called controlling the R number. Um, now, I gave this lecture last year, and 
a lot of students didn't know what the R number was, and that was absolutely normal at the time. Um, now, this year, um, I'm sure you'll understand what the R number is. I'm sure you'll have heard about the R number. I'm sure you'll understand the importance of keeping the R number low. Um, but just to discuss it here, the R number is the reproductive number, which is essentially the number of additional infections you can expect to occur as a result of each infective case. So each infection in the population, how many additional infections would you expect to that that infection to spawn. You can also say, if an average person is infected, how many additional people would you expect them to infect? Now, it's important we remember this is an average, um, so it's not an absolute value in the sense that, let's say the R number is four, so the average additional infections from an infective case is four. That doesn't mean most people who are infected are going to infect exactly four additional people. That would be a median. It's not a median. It's just a mean. It's just a rough average. So that means some people could infect a large number of people. Some people could infect no one. Some people could infect just one or two. And the average, the average across the population, that's what the R number is. So it's a true average, right? Um, th th that's important because there are events that can be you might have heard of things like super spreader events or individuals referred to as super spreaders. And there's this idea that some individuals who are infected can, um, for various reasons, pass uh, the infectious agent onto a large, large number of individuals. Um, it could be as a result of circumstances, um, but fundamentally the end result is the same. A large number of additional individuals become infected um, and so these super spreader events often exist. Um, so that's why it's important we don't think of this R number as the absolute number of cases that each infective individual results in. Um, that it's not absolute, it's an average. Okay, so some infective cases will result in more additional infections, some will result in less, but the average is the R number. Um, the key point um, with regards to the R number is one. So the key R number is one. If the R number is below one, then we are in a good situation. If the R number is above one, we are in a bad situation. And what I essentially mean by that is, if the R number is above one, then you are seeing an increase in infections because each infected person infects more than one additional person. So the number of cases will be going up. If the R number is just over one, you could likely see a small increase, but if it's a lot over one, um, you can potentially see a very, very rapid increase. And obviously these are not, these aren't good situations, right? Um, that's why we see um, the attention given to the R number in the news. And when you're reading the R number in the news, you'll often see the articles refer to <clears throat> whether the R number is below one or above one. And they'll say, oh, the R number has been brought below one. It's now 0.8, it's now 0.7. And they'll report this as a good thing. And it is a good thing because it means the trend of cases is going down. If the R number is above one, then the trend of cases is going up things are getting worse. Um, so obviously the idea is we need to do something about that to bring the R number down. And again, the tipping point is one. So we want the R number under one because it means we are seeing a decline in cases because <clears throat> the average infective case results in less than one additional cases. So the total number of cases is um, declining. So it's on a downtrend. Therefore, one of our principal goals as virologists and specifically virologists thinking of the problem from an epidemiological perspective is to lower the R number. So what we fundamentally want to do um, when an infectious agent is spreading through a population is bring down the R number, bring down the R number as low as we can get it, ideally below one. So then the infectious agent will ultimately die out within the population. Um, there's a range of strategies that we can use to lower the R number. Some of these strategies, again, I might have talked about with you in other modules or previously. What we want to do now is go into a lot more detail about these strategies and specifically look at how these strategies are applied in the context of viral diseases, in the context of viral infection. Um, 
straight away jump into the front of your mind i can imagine is covid19 sars coronavirus 2 um because that's exactly what we've been trying to do over the last year right we've been trying or almost a year and we've been trying to lower the r number and we've been using the strategies that we're going to talk about some today and that you've probably heard about again previously in other modules the strategies to lower the r number quarantines um quarantines and lockdowns um now bringing in the vaccine for example um self-isolation uh these are all the principle behind them is to lower the r number it's to inhibit the spread of the virus again and lowering the r number the r number is a measure of the spread right so stopping the spread and lowering the r number is the same thing we like to use the r number because we can see that really clear tipping point where if the r number is below one that's good we're on track if it's above one then we're not doing well things need to change we need to bring that r number down so again what we're going to do now is discuss some of the specific ways we try to lower the r number of viral diseases and again this is the core focus of epidemiology because as epidemiologists with our epidemiology hat on when we're thinking about population level um, we can track the r number and we can think about strategies that we can enact at a population level to bring down the r number so this r number is a a core element of epidemiology because it is fundamentally tied to this idea of looking at a disease on a population level if you're just looking at individual infections and you're just treating individual people um, obviously there's a huge amount of value in that but we also need to be collecting the epidemiological data so we can understand this r number so we can understand how the infectious agent is progressing is it spreading is it um are cases decreasing are they increasing these are things we need to understand and again this is all epidemiology so the two um boxes at the bottom we have the compatibility and the encounter filter so the compatibility filter and the encounter filter um, and these two concepts relate to the two different strategies or the umbrellas of strategies that we can use to lower the R number. Now, the compatibility filter refers to the idea that a virus can only infect an individual who is susceptible to infection. Another way we can say susceptible is to say compatible. So if an individual is compatible with the particular virus, it, it means they can be infected and therefore infection could potentially occur. One way we can lower the R number, so prevent cases, is by making more and more people incompatible. If more people are incompatible, then less people are compatible and this compatibility filter is closed so it's just harder for the virus to spread it's harder to the for the virus to initiate and establish new infections and we see the r number then comes down the encounter filter on the other hand refers to the fact that any particular virus can only infect individuals it physically comes into contact with so it can only infect individuals it actually encounters so another way we can lower the R number is by closing this encounter filter. And what we mean by that is preventing a virus from coming into contact with individuals. Because again, if the virus isn't coming into contact with individuals, it can infect them. This is the entire principle of um, quarantines, of lockdowns, of everything that's gone on over summer, of self-isolation if you have symptoms. The idea is to keep individuals apart particularly keep um, potentially infected individuals isolated and apart so the virus does not come into contact with people so there are fewer encounter events the fewer the encounter events the fewer potential infections and therefore the lowering of the r number again this all the main principle behind these lockdowns is this encounter filter reducing the number of encounters because each encounter with the virus is a potential infection so what we want to do today is work through these two filters and actually think about the strategies we use um, to close these two filters now i'm not going to go on about um covid too much 
Um, I'm going to be hopefully using a wide range of viral examples, but I'm sure in the front of your mind you're going to be thinking about COVID, and that's absolutely fine. Um, it's just I, I think it's interesting to use other examples as well. So firstly, we're going to be talking about this compatibility filter and the different strategies um, that we can use to close this compatibility filter. And again, by closing the compatibility filter, what we mean is by making more individuals incompatible uh, with the virus again making uh, um and this is the idea again by making more individuals incompatible reducing the number of infections and lowering the r number now some of the different ways we can close the compatibility filter are listed here and again by closing the compatibility filter what we essentially mean is making more individuals incompatible with the virus, so making them non-susceptible to infection. Um, these four ways listed here um, are widely used, they're effective, they're efficacious, um, and they're what we're gonna talk about today. So previous infection, prophylactic drugs, natural resistance, um, uh, and vaccines as well. Vaccines, we're going to talk about a little bit less because I feel like we've talked about vaccines before and we, we, we've talked about them um, to a sufficient degree. I think you have a good understanding of vaccines and how they're used. I mean, in the context of epidemiology, what a vaccine is essentially doing is in, inducing incompatibility within the population, right? What we want to do with the population is to go from the population on the bottom left in the diagram on the slide to the population on the bottom right. So on the bottom left, we have a highly compatible population. The bottom right, we have a highly protected population. Um, by protected, we mean incompatible. So we're going from a compatible population to an incompatible population. What's the best way to make an individual incompatible with a particular virus? It is to immunize them. And how do we immunize someone? We vaccinate them. OK, and that's why vaccines are so, so effective at preventing infectious diseases, because we vaccinate as many people in the population as we can. And by doing so, we are closing that compatibility filter. We are making as many people as possible incompatible with the virus. And therefore, the virus is just it doesn't have individuals to infect. It can't spread because anyone it encounters is, is resistant. They're vaccinated. They're immunized. They're incompatible. So the virus can no longer spread throughout the population. And again, that's what's happening when we have widespread vaccination campaigns. That's what's hopefully happening in the case of COVID beginning this morning um, or when will you be watching this? Um, so beginning Tuesday morning, yesterday morning, um, with the first individual becoming vaccinated to COVID, that individual is hopefully now incompatible um, with SARS coronavirus 2 infection. And as more individuals become vaccinated, they will hopefully become incompatible too. And we will see a shift from the population on the left, um, the compatible population to the population on the right. So the protected population, the incompatible population. Again, that's how viruses should work. They close this compatibility filter. Um, it's a very effective strategy. The reason why we didn't do it straight away to prevent the spread of SARS coronavirus 2 is because, as I'm 100% sure you know, we simply didn't have a vaccine. Um, now we do have a vaccine. We have many vaccines, or many in different stages of development. So hopefully we'll be able to close this compatibility filter. Uh, the other strategies that we can use to close the compatibility filter include prophylaxis. Now, prophylaxis, as we've discussed in a, a little, little bit, is the idea of treating an individual for an infection that isn't there yet, essentially. So you're prophylactically treating them. You're treating them um, with the ex expectation that they may become exposed to a particularly infectious agent. And the principle is that if they do become exposed to the infectious agent, because they're already receiving some kind of treatment or some kind of intervention they are resistant to the particular infectious agent another way to say they are resistant is to say they are incompatible so again we are closing the compatibility filter and this does appear to work to a degree um, 
it has limitations you know as i'm sure you know all these things have limitations uh, many prophylaxis rely for example upon individuals taking drugs every day um, we're talking about varicella zoster virus here which is a herpes virus um, as i'm sure you know for a lot of herpes viruses we can treat them with acyclovir and the prophylaxis for varicella zoster virus is uh, acyclovir again usually used in pill form not always but usually in pill form and the issue there is you have to remember to take the pills every day right um, even if it's a topical solution you have to remember to apply it and regardless prophylaxis requires um, repeated administration it's not like a vaccine where you can just become vaccinated once or twice or three times with a couple of booster shots um, you have to have this continued use so there's limitations there also things like pill fatigue however what we're going to look at in the next few slides is the supporting evidence that prophylaxis does work despite these limitations and it's important we remember that that even though a lot of these strategies do have limitations that doesn't mean they're not effective that doesn't mean they're not useful it just means they're not perfect and at the end of the day no therapeutic intervention is perfect every single therapeutic intervention has limitations now this study on the right of the screen is discussing the use of acyclovir as a prophylaxis to prevent um, varicella zoster virus infection in individuals who've had um, HCT, so hematopoietic stem cell transplant. A key element of uh, prophylaxis is determining, uh, determining who to administer the prophylaxis to, right? Um, Prophylaxis needs to be cost effective. We can't afford to give everyone in the population um, every drug to make them resistant to every single disease. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, so what we need to do is target high risk populations, target individuals who have susceptibility. So target the people who need the intervention essentially. It makes the most sense, it's the most effective and it's the most cost effective. Um, strategy this is why we do it um, the in reason why hct individuals so individuals who have undergone hct um, are susceptible to virus zoster virus is because they're immunocompromised and as we know immunocompromisation can um, lead to susceptibility to infections fundamentally that's what immunocompromisation is right it means you have a compromised immune system so you're intrinsically susceptible to additional infections um, one of which is virus zoster virus infection so we can see all the principles of prophylaxis being played out here it's a population with an increased susceptibility to a particular infectious disease so they are determined to be high risk so prophylaxis is used and in this case prophylaxis works so acyclovir um, has successfully reduced varicella zoster virus after hct just a quick reminder here i'm not going to go into the mechanism of acyclovir because we've talked about it before um, but acyclovir is an antiviral it's inhibiting the viral replication cycle of herpes viruses and specifically it is inhibiting the genomic processes if this doesn't sound familiar i'd encourage you to go back a few lectures and make sure you understand um, what acyclovir is and make sure you understand more broadly how these different antivirals work and again here we see the same principles played out um, we see the idea that if you're giving um, a therapeutic intervention to an individual before they are exposed to a particular infectious agent you are potentially um, able to make them incompatible and so therefore you're able to resist um, they're able to resist infection so there's no actual um, infectious event um, they're incompatible the virus can't infect them so again this is pr prophylaxis or a and a specific type of prophylaxis called pre-exposure so you're making them incompatible before they come into contact with the infectious agent just like we just saw um, so in this case of HIV we see another principle play out as well um, we see that the high risk groups are targeted specifically so here is a paper um, suggesting that um, at risk individuals are the individuals who should be receiving PrEP PrEP is shorthand for pre-exposure prophylaxis usually referred to 
the specific um, pre-exposure prophylaxis used um, to prevent HIV, which is just a cocktail of antiretrovirals, the same drugs, again, that are used to treat HIV. Um, uh, so again, here, they are identifying high-risk individuals who should be on PrEP or who the paper can recommend PrEP for. And these individuals who are in kind of subpopulations with high um, HIV prevalence, so prevalence of 2% or above, or populations that have 2% or above, either way, if um, they're in a population or subpopulation with a prevalence of 2% or incidence of 2%, sorry, um, then the paper recommends they be taking PrEP. Um, also, if an individual is in a circumstance that puts them at high risk, so they're not just in a population that's at high risk, so aside from the population, they're in a circumstance that puts them at high risk. Um, for example, if they are a seronegative individual in a relationship with a seropositive individual, so they don't have HIV, but they are in a sexual relationship with someone who does have HIV, they are potentially in a high risk um, scenario, a high risk situation, high risk circumstances. So therefore, it's justifiable that they take PrEP. Just like um, in the last slide, where individuals who had hematopoietic um, cell transplants, uh, these individuals were determined to be um, high risk of uh, additional infections, including varicella zoster virus, because they are immunocompromised. So it makes sense to give them free exposure prophylaxis to um, free, uh, varicella zoster virus, which is acyclovir. And these particular individuals are at high risk of acquiring HIV infection, so it makes sense to give them a pre-exposure prophylaxis that reduces the likelihood of them contracting HIV, so that makes them incompatible with HIV. Now, as always, we want to be thinking critically. Um, we want to be, and there's a, it can almost feel cynical because you're constantly looking at what's wrong with things, right? And it's, it, it can feel a little bit cynical, but what we're essentially doing is identifying issues that we can solve. So on the surface, PrEP sounds good, but what can we do better? Are there any issues there or any things that need to be resolved? And one of the issues that needs to be resolved with PrEP is something we've mentioned before. And it's the idea that PrEP used specifically for HIV, so to induce incompatibility with HIV and reduce HIV infections is associated with an increase in other STIs um, and it's also associated with an increase in condom less sex so essentially an increase in high risk behaviors um, that this is this is a real issue isn't it it's a and, and it's something that people knew that was going to happen by the way it, it, it wasn't a surprise it's something people were worried about um, the prediction was um, okay if individuals start taking prep they become resistant to HIV infection and they know they have a resistance to HIV infection. They're going to change their behavior. They're going to stop engaging in safe sex and start engaging in unsafe sex because they believe they're protected from HIV. Um, and then what you're going to see is an increase in other sexually transmitted infections, chlamydia, syphilis, herpes viruses, gonorrhea. Um, th that's essentially what we're seeing. Um, and it's unfortunate, again, it's kind of predicted. Uh, so it's actually often not as simple as it appears on the surface. So on the surface, it can be a case of, um, okay, PrEP reduces HIV, tr HIV transmission, so it's intrinsically good. But there's negatives to it, as we can see here. Um, so it's something we need to think about. I mean, it's an evaluation point, one of the many evaluation points that we can think about with PrEP. Um, it doesn't mean, again, it, it, just because there's this criticism and this valid criticism, so a limitation, doesn't mean PrEP is no good. PrEP is still used and it still does reduce HIV transmission overall. But one of the big questions to be answered when PrEP was first being rolled out and locked into was, is the resistance obtained from PrEP strong enough to counteract the inevitable behavioral changes? Because if individuals are engaging more in condomless sex, they're actually potentially increasing their um, likelihood of contracting HIV, right? Because they're coming into um, contact with HIV more often, potentially they're increasing their likelihood of coming into contact with HIV. So there was um, a real risk 
that PrEP usage could have been associated with an increase in HIV infection. Again, this is why uh, low efficacy vaccines are essentially useless or worse than useless. So if you have a vaccine that induces a very, very low level of protection, it's no good at all because individuals will become vaccinated, they'll think they're protected, then they'll change their behaviour and they will potentially be changing their behaviour and putting themselves at risk of a particular infectious agent because they assume they are protected, but really their changes in behaviour counteract the, any protection they have from the vaccine and they end up at more risk than they ever were. Um, so again, these are things we need to think about. These interventions are not straightforward. OK, um, so that's the pre-exposure prophylaxis and some of the issues we need to think about. Um, there's another type of prophylaxis as well, which is post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, in an ideal world, we would identify all individuals who are at high risk of serious infectious diseases. We would um, prophylactically um, intervene. Um, pre-exposure, so before they came into contact with a particular infectious agent, and they would therefore never um, become infected. Uh, obviously, this isn't always possible. It's just not how it works in the real world. Um, there's another option in the case of many infectious agents, however, or many infectious diseases, and that is post-exposure prophylaxis. So if an individual has already been exposed to a particular infectious agent, it's not the end of the world necessarily because sometimes interventions can be made that can prevent infection from being established. So we still consider post-exposure prophylaxis a prophylaxis um, or a prophylactic because the intervention is being made before the infection is established but it's after they've been exposed to it. So very often the virus is circulating within the body, the virus is replicating, um, so it is really urgent that a treatment is um, initiated or an intervention is initiated before uh, infection becomes fully established. So it's essentially inhibiting viral infection in the very early stages. Uh, the clearest example of this is rabies virus, right? So we've talked about um, how rabies virus is a deadly infection um, it, it almost invariably causes death. There's a f small handful of individuals who survived rabies infection. Vast, vast majority die. Um, the key takeaway is if an individual experiences symptoms, then there's no effective treatment. So if an individual actually experiences symptoms of rabies virus, and there's a whole range of symptoms, mostly neurological symptoms, um, anxiety, some general viral symptoms, um, hallucinations, personality changes, uh, ultimately down the line, hydrophobia, so fear of water. But if they experience essentially any symptoms at all of rabies virus, then that means the infection has already become established and there's no actual treatment for infection. What there is, however, is a post-exposure prophylactic vaccine. Right. Um, so we know vaccines are prophylactic um, because you give them before infection. Right. Um, but the way rabies vaccine is slightly different from the other vaccines, which is why we want to talk about it now, is because it's post exposure. OK. Um, again, if an individual ho already has symptoms, the post exposure prophylactic won't do anything. The vaccine won't do anything because the window has been missed. These post exposure prophylactics need to be used again, after an individual has been exposed, but before infection has actually established itself. So when an individual is exposed to rabies virus, there is a window in which they can potentially become vaccinated. That's why if you ever have been unfortunate enough to have um, been suspected of being exposed to rabies virus or know anyone in that situation, um, they will have hopefully and most likely been offered a rabies vaccine and strongly encouraged to take one. Because again, it's only useful um, within this um, window period. Uh, the same is true for the post-exposure prophylactic of HIV. So again, it's just antiretroviral, so the same as PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis fundamentally. Sometimes the drug's different, um, but not always. But anyway, the principle is the same. Um, you're treating infection before it's established. With HIV, there's a 
our window. So if an individual is um, suspected to have been exposed to HIV, they will be strongly encouraged to um, take post-exposure prophylaxis. So take, um, uh, again, it's called PEP rather than PrEP for about a month. And so they're taking the antiretrovirals every day. Uh, again, it has to be begun within 72 hours. If an individual presents to a clinic, often a sexual health clinic, um, suspecting they may have been exposed to HIV um, the night before or, you know, the night before, the night before, within 72 hours, um, often the clinician will, and again, I'm not a clinician, but often what is done is it's recommended they start um, post-exposure prophylaxis straight away. Um, if that 72 hour window period has gone, then it's um, it, the, the, the literature shows that it doesn't work outside those 72 hours. So it's really critical it's began um, as soon as possible and the sooner the better. So within those 72 hours, um, the highest rate of success, so the highest prevention of HIV establishment is within the first 24 hours. And I think even within the 12 hours, it's even higher than that. So the later it's left, the less likely um, um, the PEP is to be successful because again, the more likely it is that infection has already become established. Um, I've got on the side here this idea of MTCT, which is mother to child transmission. Um, so mother to child transmission or mother child transmission. Um, it's a real significant problem for a lot of infectious diseases. And um, what we're going to focus on when we're talking about MTCT is the chronic infectious diseases, because these are really um, uh, these are the ones you want to stop MTCT of the most, because uh, there's just um, there's inherent value in preventing these chronic infections from being passed down to um, infants because these are chronic infections that are potentially going to impact the infant for the rest of their life um, or at least for a significant period of time so they're going to impact the infant um, significantly we have to remember as well an infant doesn't have an established immune system so much um, it's it, it, it has an it's it's immunologically naive we would say that term immunologically naive uh, so if an infant is exposed to some infectious agents the impact on the infant will be a lot more severe than an adult in many cases um, so we really really want to prevent mother to child transmission and again particularly of the chronic viral infections i'm thinking about hiv really um also hbv um herpes viruses as well we just want to prevent them because it's it, uh, it it's just um it has such a profound impact on an infant's life for a long, long period of time that, again, there's inherent value in preventing mother-to-child transmission and a lot of effort is um, put into it. What we have on the right is a paper discussing specifically uh, hepatitis B virus and specifically hepatitis B virus being transmitted from mother to child. And the paper is outlining the different strategies that can be used to prevent a mother to child transmission. And there's a few different strategies, uh, one of which, um, and first off, the suggestion is all these strategies are used together. And you'll see this a lot in the papers. We tend to pit ideas against each other when we're evaluating them. And it's totally acceptable to do that because we want to see which are best and which work in different situations. But very often, um, different strategies are used together. So they're overlapping, they complement, and that's great because they strengthen each other, they build on each other. Um, and as we can see in HPV, uh, th th there's a few different ideas of how to prevent MTCT, but at the core, providing infant post-exposure uh, prophylaxis. So this prophylaxis, um, again, the idea is the baby, the infant, is treated as soon as possible, um, as soon as possible after birth to prevent the infection from taking hold. And part of this is vaccination, so the normal um, hepatitis B virus vaccination, and part of it is um, immunoglobulin or immune, immune, globul immune globulin, so hepatitis B um, immune globulin, so which is going to directly treat the infection. Now, again, there isn't actually an established infection there, but hopefully this prophylactic treatment which is again post-exposure because the infant has been exposed to HPV 
through the mother. Hopefully this intervention is going to prevent um, infe actual infection from becoming established. And it usually does a huge proportion of the time. So this paper suggests between 85 and 95 percent of the time um, transmission can be prevented from mother to child, which is um, which is great, you know, which is excellent. And another infectious disease that we understandably want to prevent transmission uh, to the infant of is HIV. So if you have a HIV positive mother, we want to prevent transmission of HIV to the infant. So you want to prevent a mother to child transmission. And like HBV, um, we see that prophylactic um, treatment of HIV, so this intervention to prevent transmission is used in conjunction with other strategies included including um, diagnostic measures so we mentioned screening for hbv um, while the paper mentioned screening and um, for hiv we're just talking about hiv tests right so we have rapid antibody tests that can be used very very quickly to determine if the mother is hiv positive um, and if the mother is hiv positive so she tests and positive through um, a HIV antibody test, then prophylaxis should be begun on the infant um, immediately and also on the mother as well. Um, more long-term strategies, if a mother is already known to be HIV positive, then the infection should be under control with antiretrovirals anyway in an ideal situation. Um, this, this instance here is talking about a bit of an emergency situation really because this um, rapid HIV antibody test isn't uh, generally speaking um, enough to confirm a HIV diagnosis anyway so it strongly indicates HIV positive status but it's usually used in conjunction with something else with a western blot with a PCR with some other form of diagnostic test and together the rapid test plus the other diagnostic test provides sufficient support for a confirmed HIV diagnosis but by itself a HIV antibody test result this is st definitely strong enough justification to begin prophylaxis in the baby in the infant and these strategies are described in this paper as extraordinarily successful and extraordinarily effective now scientists tend to be quite tempered with their language they don't tend to use um, these kind of superlatives and going over the top so the fact that it's being described as extraordinarily effective extraordinarily successful really to show um, how successful it's been uh, which is an amazing thing right um, an amazing thing if an individual is in a situation where they can take advantage of these advancements obviously um, 
some individuals are not able to access the healthcare to prevent this transmission. Uh, so less economically developed countries, um, th there's um, a large number of you know, mother to child transmissions. Um, a lot of those transmissions are a result um, or they are potentially preventable if the drugs are available, if the resources are available, if there's infrastructure, if there's healthcare. So again, obviously, um, we're, we're remembering there's context, um, there's real world situations that impact um, the, whether these strategies can be implemented. So even if they are successful and effective strategies, they can't necessarily be implemented successfully in every situation. So what we want to discuss now is really the final big significant determinant of host compatibility. Um, so it's not necessarily something where um, manipulating therapeutically, although there's room for potential for that down the line. However, it's something we need to be aware of because it's a real, um, it, it, it's a real impactful determinant of susceptibility and also not just susceptibility, so not just whether or not disease happens, but also the disease course, so the outcome of the disease, um, how severe the disease is, for example. Uh, what I'm referring to is host variation. So I'm referring to the fact that different people are inherently different and they experience disease in slightly different ways, sometimes significantly different ways. And what we can actually do is tie down the specific differences and look at the differences or the specific differences that impact different diseases. Um, what this paper is a really good paper it's a review and it basically outlines the general concept here and it talks through some significant human diseases and defines some of the ways that host variation can impact um, disease severity and disease incidence and things like that and as we can see from this quote um, one of the factors uh, or one of the umbrella of factors um, are genetic factors so there's all different types of genetic factors that can impact um, a host susceptibility to disease and the disease course as well. So obviously we have the human genome and we all have genetic components that are common across humans. However, obviously, as we understand, we also have um, elements of the genome that are unique. No one has exactly the same genome as anyone else. That's why no one is exactly the same as anyone else. And as part of this natural variation, we have variants that, again, induce disease susceptibility and induce various elements of pathogenesis and disease progression and things like that. Um, often they're immunological factors. So often the genetic variations are in components of the immune system. And this is why they have an impact on disease susceptibility, on pathogenesis and things like that. So there are a lot of very specific um, immune variations across individuals that impact those things and we know this because we've discussed it before when we were discussing the CCR5 mutation that alters susceptibility to HIV so a small percentage of northern Europeans have a CCR5 mutation so CCR5 delta 32 so there are 32 amino acids missing from their CCR5 again CCR5 is the co-receptor that enables HIV to enter into cells. Um, because they have this CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, they are lacking um, this portion of the CCR5 and therefore they do not have a susceptibility or they have a reduced susceptibility to HIV infection because HIV essentially requires um, functioning fully formed CCR5 to enter into the immune cells. Um, it's not all about genetic variation uh, in terms of Im immune factors, but there's also human variation across age, for example. So different people are different ages and age can impact susceptibility to disease and it can impact a disease course as well. Um, there's a concept called immunosenescence that we'll talk about in a couple of slides and senescence meaning essentially biological aging. Um, so immunosenescence means aging of the immune system. An elderly person's immune system does not function as well as the immune system of someone who is uh, younger, for example.
We also have to consider um, the presence or absence of other infections. Um, this includes chronic infections as well as acute infections. So if we're thinking about chronic infections, um, chronic infections can often cause um, immunosuppression or um, immunodeficiency, obviously HIV, but other chronic infections as well can also impact the immune system. Um, if we're thinking about acute infections, then a localized infection can present uh, the opportunity for additional infections to occur. Um, a common example is if you have athlete's foot. Athlete's foot is compromising the epithelium, so you are then more susceptible to additional infections when other microorganisms pass through these breaches in the epithelium, right? So if you compare an individual with athlete's foot to an individual who doesn't have athlete's foot, the individual with athlete's foot has an increased susceptibility to um, various infections that could potentially pass through um, the breaches in the epithelium. If we think about um, non-infectious diseases as well, so diabetes can induce immunodeficiency. So there we have a non-infectious disease, diabetes, but it's still capable of inducing increased susceptibility to infectious diseases through its effect on the um, immune system. Uh, other examples as well, if we think about STIs, so a lot of STIs compromise the epithelium in the genital urinary tract, which increases susceptibility to viral infections like HPV and HIV cytomegalovirus because they're providing an opportunity for the virus to pass through the epithelium. Okay, and this is essentially um, uh, building on that fact. Uh, latent viruses in a healthy person can stay latent for a long period of time. And they can have limited pathogenesis because they're being controlled by the immune system. However, if you have an individual who um, is immunocompromised, you can see chronic infections, latent infections being far, far more severe um, because they're not able to be suppressed by the immune system. Um, latency is a biological strategy, so viruses use latency. However, it's the immune system that enforces that latency. It, the immune system will often force the virus to stop replicating because there's immune mechanisms inhibiting replication. So the virus enters into a latent state. Um, if there's no functioning immune system, then you can get a chronic um, active infection. And if we think about um, uh, particularly uh, that it's not on the slide, it's not in this paper as an example, but if we think about herpes viruses, we can just think about chronic reactivations rather than occasional sporadic activations. So activations happening again and again and again, and activations being more and more severe. Um, again, uh, this is a, a potential consequence of an individual being immunocompromised. And if we looked, if we think looking back at the example of varicella zoster virus prophylaxis, the reason why individuals who have a hematopoietic cell transplant are given a cyclovir as a prophylaxis against varicella zoster virus is because they have an increased susceptibility to varicella zoster virus in their, in their vulnerable state, if we like. Okay, um, this is another example of host variation. It's a vague one, uh, a shaky one that we don't fully understand, but it's an important one nonetheless. And it's this idea that disease can sometimes be um, fundamentally sporadic. So you can get an infectious agent that does cause severe disease in some hosts. Um, however, in other hosts, in the same species, so we're talking about human hosts here, um, there is no disease. And often it's a very, very small percentage of individuals who are affected that experience disease. And we don't always fully understand why. So we're talking about the same virus and we're talking about the same species of host. However, we're talking also about there being these dramatic differences in the consequences of infection. We're talking about the difference between a mild infection or even an asymptomatic infection and really significant um, symptoms. Uh, paralytic polio, for example. So I'm sure we know that polio virus can cause paralysis. However, it only causes paralysis in a very, very small minority of cases, uh, less than 1%. 
it's not entirely clear why poliovirus sometimes causes symptoms, such as severe symptom paralysis, and sometimes doesn't cause this symptom at all. I mean, we know poliovirus replicates in motor neurons and it causes lysis of motor neurons, but it, it, that's the mechanism by which it replicates. So why isn't it causing paralytic um, polio in all individuals? We're not entirely sure. I mean, there's a suggestion here that it could be linked um, to interferon production. And as we know, because we looked at it the other week, interferon production is a core element of the immune response to viral infection. So if we get defective interferon production, we could potentially have enhanced viral replication. Uh, this is a theory not proved. But even if it is true, then again, we have we have nailed, we have identified the host variation that is fundamentally responsible for the different um, pathogenesis, um, so the different um, disease cause observed. Another example we have here is herpes simplex encephalitis. So herpes simplex, we know herpes simplex, it's a herpes virus. Um, it can sometimes cause encephalitis, which is infection, fundamentally infection and inflammation of the brain. Um, it occurs in a minority of people. Um, we don't actually know exactly why. So again, there must be some host variation. We just haven't exactly identified what that host variation is. Um, there's some data suge to suggest it's again something to do with immune signaling. Uh, TLR3, as we, I'm sure we know, is a pattern recognition receptor. Um, UNC93B, this is probably new to us, it's just involved in immune signaling. So again, the idea here is that the potential host variation that could be causing the different disease outcome is, immuno the, is immunological. So it's differences in immune function. As we've said earlier, age is a significant um, host variation. So a variant across hosts that can um, be linked to differential disease incidence and disease progression as well. And it's this concept of immunosenescence, of the immune system aging, of the immune system changing over time, of on average, older people having a less functional immune system, a less effective immune system than younger people. Uh, influenza is a clear example of this. An influenza infection in a young, healthy individual in their 20s is typically, statistically, very different um, in terms of outcome and progression to an influenza infection in an individual in their 90s. You know, we intuitively understand this, I'm sure. Uh, but again, just laying out that this is an example of host variation and the variant here is age. Um, technically, the relevant aspect of age we, we're referring to is this concept of immunosenescence, this idea that the immune system itself ages and changes over time. Now, this process of immunosenescence is summarized here in this really strange diagram. I've, it's, it's the best diagram I could find in terms, it's in a published paper, by the way. It's really cartoony, really weird. I don't like it. But the information is there, and that's what matters. Um, and the information is quite clear. I don't actually care about you learning this information at all. The only point I'm trying to make is we can see these widespread um, immune changes going on. So various aspects of the immune system are changing um, as individuals are aging. Again, this is immunosenescence, senescence meaning biological aging. Um, one thing it is useful for you to remember specifically is this concept of inflammaging. Um, when you're reading papers on this kind of thing, um, you'll come across this term inflammaging. And what it essentially refers to is in elderly individuals, as they age, they slip into a state of chronic immunological activation. Um, and the specific immunological activation is inflammation. So they often have um, systematic or systemic, sorry, uh, widespread inflammation. Uh, and we call this inflammaging because it's associated with age. And as you might expect, it impacts um, susceptibility to disease and the course of disease. Okay, um, so next we want to consider closing the encounter filter and then we want to move into a little bit of ethics. 
Um, we're actually going to do this in the second part of the epidemi epidemiology um, content. So we're coming up to an hour now, so we'll call it a day for today. Um, this epidemiology is being delivered in two parts. Um, so we, we've done compatibility today and I, I've talked a bit too much to be honest, but it doesn't matter because we can do encounter filter next week um, and we can do ethics as well, which is a hugely important part of epidemiology. When you're making epidemiological decisions, which are often you know, public health decisions, um, then you're making decisions that are gonna impact a huge amount of people without necessarily having their consent. And we know consent is a huge part of ethics, right? Um, so that places a really unusual and significant burden upon individuals who make those decisions. And it's really important we understand uh, the ethical constraints um, that are present when making epidemiological decisions or attempting to understand the epidemiological decision, decisions made by others. Okay, um, thanks everyone. I'll see you on Wednesday and uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you.